So with that, we are recording. So again, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started um, talking about vegetable gardening. So here's a basic outline of what we're gonna talk about tonight. So we'll cover some kind of basics of just vegetable gardening and getting set up. We'll talk about some maintenance that you'll need to do ongoing through the season, some common issues you face, um, extending your season. And then if we have time, we'll touch on some fun things to try. Throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat box and we'll address all of those at the end of the time. So here are some great resources. I like to always do this first in case people end up having to leave or have issues and get tossed off. Um, if you are in Maryland, we highly recommend checking out the University of Maryland Extension Home and Garden Information Center, which is extension.umd.edu backslash HGIC. You can see it there. If you are out of the state of Maryland, we would recommend that you contact your own local extension service. If you're in the Mid-Atlantic, you're more than welcome to use ours. But if you are tuning in from California or someplace in the Midwest or someplace in the South, your local extension service is going to be able to give you slightly more accurate information about gardening in your climate. Um, some other great resources would be the American Horticulture Society, the National Garden Association, and then any library books you can find uh, is a really great cost-free way to also get information about gardening. So one of the first things that you need to do when you decide to start vegetable gardening is decide what you want to grow. And this is really gonna be limited by a few things. So space is one. Um, if you do not have a large backyard, you may have to opt to do something like container gardening or prioritize certain vegetables over others. The location that you have, again, along with that is also it. So if most of your backyard is in shade, you're gonna have a hard time getting a lot of your summer produce to grow. So you might be better off sticking with some of the cold season ones or trying to find some space in the front yard and or looking to see if you have a local community garden that you could rent a bed out of to grow because most vegetables as we'll cover are gonna require at least six hours of sunlight. And then you also want to pick something that you yourself or your family is going to eat. It's not worth taking the time and energy to grow anything if you're not actually going to turn around and eat it unless you're growing it for a food pantry or someone else. If you're new to vegetable gardening, we do have a few vegetables that we would recommend. Things like cherry tomatoes, radishes, green beans, sweet potatoes, and snow peas tend to be pretty easy and straightforward. Um, they tend to be rather robust in what they produce as well in the case of something like cherry tomatoes. So even if you do have a few problems, you're probably still likely going to get a good harvest out of them. So one of the things that we do want to touch on right off the bat is the difference between a cold season vegetable crop and a warm season vegetable crop. And for the sake of this talk, we'll probably use um, vegetable and fruit a little interchangeable because when you talk about harvesting something, oh, there you go. Uh, the fruits, what you're picking, and that would be the part that you would mainly be eating. But obviously, these are vegetable crops and not fruit. Um, but your cold season crops are going to be ones that you can grow in either the spring or the fall. They prefer temperature a little bit more on the cooler side. So they're looking for things in that 55 to 75 degrees. So ideally, you want to set them up so that they would be mature before the average daytime temperature is about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Once you get above that, what happens is that triggers most of these plants to flower. And when they flower, the vegetable part that you eat would become bitter. And you can see most of these are things like coal or brassica crops. So these are broccoli and cauliflowers and cabbage and leeks and radishes. So none of these are ones where it's like a flower and a producing a fruit, you're eating some part of the plant itself, whether it's the leaves or the buds or the stem or the stalks or the roots. This would be in compared to warm season crops, which would be something like tomatoes and peppers and eggplant and sweet corn, um, sweet potatoes, zucchini, squash, all of those. And these guys really need a higher soil and air temperature in order to first germinate and then in order to kind of successfully grow. So ideally you don't wanna plant these or move them outside into the last frost date. So when to plant is always the next question. So when can I plant either cold season or warm season crops? So the University of Maryland Home and Garden um, Information Center has both of these two handouts, which are available for people who live in Maryland. Again, if you live in a different area, what you may wanna do is check out uh, garden.org. That's uh, the 
American Garden Association's website and they have an app that you can put your zip code in and it will give you the average frost dates for your area. So that'll tell you when the first frost date is and when kind of your last frost date is. So you can kind of use that to predict. Um, and then if you put that with our handouts that we'll talk about, as well as information on seed packets, you can kind of backtrack to figure out like germination rates and when you need to either direct seed or start your transplants and so forth to get them in the ground. We do say that because the weather in Maryland and in a lot of the mid-Atlantic is a little unpredictable, do plan on getting something like a floating row cover or a tarp for springtime and for fall in case you do need to cover them because of an unexpected either late frost or early frost. Okay, so um, as far as reading your seed packet goes, this is a really important thing um, to do. I think all of us have looked at the back of a seed packet. There can be a lot of stuff on there, but any seed packet you get has a couple of really important things that you want to consider um, before planting. So um, Emily already kind of touched on this, but um, a full sun requirement or just the sun requirement in general, um, it should be on the back of the seed packet. And most of your vegetable crops, especially the warm season ones, are going to require six plus hours a day of sunlight. Um, the days to harvest, this can be really important if you wanna plan for a multi-season. Um, so uh, basically if you wanna have crops that you're putting in in the spring and then summer crops and then fall crops, you really need to think about how many days it's going to take from seed to harvest. Um, so you can get those spring crops out for your summer crops. Seeding depth um, and then um, individual plant spacing. I know um, probably we all look at this, but it is really important to, um, to follow. I know that especially for um, any kind of root vegetable, you really wanna get this individual plant spacing correct um, because if you plant them too close together, say uh, carrots or um, radishes, you're going to have stunted um, root growth um, because those individuals you know, are crowding each other and competing for nutrients. So they won't reach their full size potential. Um, and then if you have to thin, you're kind of wasting your seed. If, if you just follow the instructions, usually that's the best way to plant. Um, when to sow is usually on your seed packet. Now, uh, like we just talked about, these um, direct uh, sowing schedules these are going to be um, very broad ranges. So for instance, if we're here in Maryland, we're in between um, purple and green. So our planting dates um, for this could be between April and July, which is really a huge broad range. Uh, and that's why it's worth going a little bit further um, and checking like uh, the Maryland Home Garden Information Center and getting that calendar for each individual crop, because this is actually just a little too general. Um, whereas uh, the sowing instructions are usually very good to follow. And then I like to emphasize the use by date because a lot of us, um, well, if you're like me, um, you get new seeds every year. Um, every year you pick up some basil and you plant half the seed packet, and then you put it back with your other seeds. Well, maybe you've got some basil from 2017, um, and what you're gonna find is that that basil may not have the same germination rate that it had um, the year that you purchased it. Um, and so when your germination rate starts to go down, then, um, you know, then, then it's a little bit tougher to accurately space out your plants if some of them aren't germinating. So um, I, I try to, now I try to follow um, the seed packing, uh, you know, use my seeds within a year or two. So I just wanna go over a couple of plant terms because I feel like these are thrown around a lot, um, either in the news media or if you're reading a garden blog. And so we're gonna go over things from organic to cultivars um, to GMOs, um, to grafting. So, okay, so organic farming. This is an agriculture system that uses ecologically based pest controls and biological fertilizers derived largely from animal and plant waste and nitrogen fixing cover crops. Um, and so uh, basically 
In the US, if you are an organic farmer, you must follow specific government regulation um, guidelines that the USDA um, makes. So that means you can't use synthetic fertilizers, you can't use synthetic pesticides. Um, and really there's a whole inspection process and it costs quite a bit of money to get certified. However, if you're just a home gardener and you wanna practice organic um, processes, this really isn't that difficult. All you need to do is um, use organic fertilizers, um, use organic pesticides, so things like neem oil um, instead of Roundup, and then um, make an effort to just um, employ sustainable garden practices. So um, do things like planting cover crops to add nitrogen back to your soil. So um, the term cultivar um, or variety, so cultivar variety, it's the same thing. Uh, they are generally a distinct individuals that have been produced through the process of cultivation by selective breeding. So um, essentially plant breeders pick out individuals um, that they think are really good. And then those become the cultivars that seed companies and the nurseries sell. So a cultivar may have specific features such as a color or size difference from um, other individuals. And then most, like if a cultivar is being sold by a nursery, it needs to be uniform um, or as a seed packet. So if you buy, um, if you buy a brandy wine cultivar tomato um, in the year 2000, it will be the same as a brandy wine tomato um, if you buy it this year. So these individuals need to be uniform um, and the same over time. So inbreeding. In humans, inbreeding is bad, but in plants, inbreeding is defined um, as the uh, production of offspring by a mating between relatives, or usually um, it's actually from self-pollination. So inbreeding results in increased homozygosity, which means that basically all the genes end up getting fixed and become um, it's like if you got exactly the same genes from your mom as you got from your dad, that would be inbreeding. Um, and so after a few generations of inbreeding, um, which is a, a normal process that happens, especially in grasses, but also in a lot of other vegetables, you will get an individual um, from which if you save the seed, it will be genetically identical to its parent. And so for vegetables that are inbred, um, some of them are like tomatoes, you can save the seed from one generation to another and get the same crop. Um, another term for inbreeding or an inbred plant is true to type. So you may see that if you're reading a garden blog. So hybrids are actually the product of two inbred parents. So say you have two different inbreds, so they have different genes, but um, each one of them is fixed for the genes that they have, then you cross them together, that generation is called the F1 or the hybrid generation. Um, seed companies generally uh, make hybrids because uh, sometimes they can have traits that are stronger than either of the individual parents. Um, and this became popular in the early 1900s um, with corn. Uh, they saw higher yields, so the practice is now done for certain vegetables, so you can buy hybrid tomatoes. But if you save the seed from a hybrid, you will not get the same individual in the next generation. So if you buy hybrid tomatoes, don't bother saving your seed because you will get a segregating population of individuals. All the seeds will basically be different. It's like all the children, all of your children will be different. Um, so in that way, um, it's not really worth saving hybrid seed. Okay, so... GMOs, this is something probably everybody has heard of and everybody has an opinion about, but all a genetically modified organism is, um, as defined by the USDA, is an organism that is produced through the process of genetic modification. So these are not um, uh, varieties that are commonly available to home gardeners. So if you go to Home Depot, if you buy your seeds at Walmart or Tractor Supply, wherever, you are not going to be able to get um, GMO crops. So you don't even need to look for the non-GMO on there. If you go online and you specifically look for GMO 
uh, plants, you may be able to find them um, because some of the uh, GMO crops that we have in the US um, include squash, corn, soy, papaya, canola, sugar beets, cotton, potatoes, and alfalfa. And what you'll notice about a lot of these is they're not products that consumers directly consume. And that's because um, in the US, most consumers um, are not really cool with um, knowing that their food is GMO. Um, so I guess one of the examples I like to use um, to explain GMOs is uh, one of the early ones is uh, BT corn. So they took a gene from um, this bacteria, a single gene, um, they put it into corn um, and it makes the corn uh, resistant to a lot of um, soft bellied insects. So this is the reason why farmers like to use genetically modified organisms because this is some of the crop damage they would experience if they grew non-BT corn here. Okay, and then how scientists actually make um, uh, a genetically modified organism. It is not like this. If you just Google um, genetically modified crops, you will get these images of scientists putting syringes into plants. It's not like that. Um, it's actually much more technical. There are a lot of different steps, um, but you're basically using um, naturally occurring bacteria to transfer a gene from one organism to the plant. Um, and so this example that I talked about um, with BT corn, the corn got a gene from the BT bacteria, which was actually used by organic farmers, um, has been used for uh, decades to kill soft bellied insects like caterpillars. Um, and now the corn basically makes um, the protein that kills those caterpillars. So the corn is kind of making its own insecticide. Um, that's the, the quick and dirty version of GMO crops. If you guys are interested in this, I can talk a lot about that, but we won't go over it all here. Okay, the term uh, resistance in plants is normally defined as the heritable ability of a plant to resist attacking enemies partially or fully to minimize the amount of damage experienced by the plant. So the plant has basically a genetic ability to resist the pathogen, that's important. So that means it can be transferred um, generation to generation and it should be stable between individuals of that cultivar. So um, resistance traits can be things, uh, mostly you'll see resistance to a lot of different time, types of pathogens or diseases. Um, but you may also see that some plants have resistance to certain pests. So maybe they're making, um, they're making a compound that makes them taste bitter to a particular insect so the insect doesn't feed on them. Uh, most resistances come from plant breeding um, and the plant breeders will basically select the individuals that they see in a population that have resistance to that trait. Um, if you want uh, or if you know that you have a certain disease and it keeps coming back year after year, so say um, you keep seeing powdery mildew in your garden, choose a variety of plant that has resistance to that. So you can just go online. Um, if you're trying to grow um, coal vegetables and you keep getting mildew, look up some uh, different broccoli or cauliflowers um, that have resistance to, to mildew. All right, the term heirloom. This literally heirloom is a cultivar that has been nurtured, selected, and handed down from one family member to another for many generations. Um, and these are basically just old, old school varieties. So um, they're very popular right now, like heirloom tomatoes. You'll see a lot of buzz about them. Some of them look really funny. They can have really cool patterns. Um, some of them have really great um, flavors. Uh, however, a lot of heirloom varieties tend not to have resistance or less resistance to a lot of the diseases that are very common. Um, and so most of the inbred varieties are also, um, or most of the heirloom varieties are also inbred, not hybrids. Um, and so they can be maintained through seed saving. But I just, I want to emphasize they can be trickier to grow than um, say a hybrid or a modern variety. So if you're growing 
heirloom tomatoes and they don't look like this picture, they look more like this picture, that's okay, that's normal. Um, especially I think if you're growing uh, heirloom tomatoes, plant a couple of um, modern or new conventional varieties along with it and just you know see what you get. Okay, um, and so the last plant term I wanna talk about is grafting. So vegetable grafting creates a new plant by combining two different plants with two different genetic backgrounds together. So the top plant is going to be the scion. It provides um, all the shoots and it's what determines the fruit quality of the vegetable. Whereas um, the bottom part will become the roots and that's called the rootstock. Um, and what you're doing when you're grafting a vegetable is you're trying to provide a high quality scion that maybe makes really good fruit, but has a crappy root system. You're trying to give it better roots. So um, this is especially common for watermelons, but um, uh, really any kind of melon, squash, cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, anything that gets a lot of root diseases um, uh, is fair game for vegetable grafting. So. The scion, uh, you know, it wins because it gets a stronger root system. They might cost you a little bit more. Obviously, you're going to be buying uh, grafted vegetables as transplants. You can't seed them. Um, and uh, grafting is a common practice among fruit trees and woody, woody species. So, um, yeah, this is this is a pretty common practice among vegetables and fruits. Okay. Emily, I think it's back over to you. Awesome. So now we're gonna move into kind of garden maintenance. So again, for those of you who've been gardening for a while, a lot of this may be very familiar to you, but it's always a good reminder. And then for those of you who are new, these are kinds of things to think about as you're setting up your vegetable garden this upcoming season. So when it comes to getting your garden ready, preparation and taking some time to really prepare things can really go a long way. So before you even get plants, you do want to think about building up your beds. If you have raised beds already, that's great. If you don't and you're going to do in-ground gardens, you do want to take a time to sort of mark that out, kill off any turf grass you need, and then kind of build up and or separate out what is going to be bed versus what is going to not be. Um, we highly recommend that you take a soil test, and we'll talk a little bit about that more in a sec. Um, but if your soil test says that your soil needs to be amended, if you take it now, that gives you enough time to actually put those amendments in, because many of them are going to take some time to sort of work their way into the soil and to do whatever they need to do, specifically if your pH needs to be amended. Uh, as you can see from the graph seen here, if your pH is off a little bit, the ability of your plant to take up various nutrients can really be hindered. So most plants are gonna want fairly neutral soil with the exception of maybe something like blueberries that want acidic. Um, another thing that you can start doing and that you should do in preparation would be loosening up any soil and then adding compost in as well. So compost will touch a little bit more when we talk about fertilizers, but it also, does a lot to add organic matter and to really help and benefit building your soil structure. Um, so when it comes to soil testing, we recommend you do this every three to four years, particularly if you are doing in-ground or raised beds. If you're doing containers and you're dumping out your potting mix every year and buying fresh, then you don't obviously need to do a soil test. But if you're doing anything where you're reusing the same soil over and over again, every three to four years, you should do it. And this is just a really inexpensive way to know what your soil looks like, because you have to remember the soil is basically the home for your plant. It needs to get everything out of your soil. It needs to, it's where it's going to uptake its water. It's where it's going to get all of its nutrients. And without a good, healthy soil, you're not going to really get good plants. When it comes to taking a soil test, you can check um, the University of Maryland Home and Garden Extension's website. We have videos and diagrams and all kinds of stuff, but ideally what you're gonna to wanna to do is just take a sample or two, so about 12 samples, about eight inches deep, and then you'll mix them up in a plastic bucket, and then you can mail them off in a paper bag to a soil comp testing facility. And what they will do is send you back 
a sheet that will give you uh, information about your soil. And we recommend doing this over buying a kit because you do tend to get a wide your selection of things. Um, so you'll get nutrient contents, including phosphorus, potassium, and calcium. You'll get your pH, you'll get your organic matter. And more so, you're going to get recommendations. Um, and if you tell them specifically, like, this is going to be a vegetable garden and here's the vegetables I'm growing, they will tell you exactly how much nitrogen and other stuff you need to get your soil in the ideal condition. If you go to the box stores and buy that kit, yes, that kit might tell you, okay, fine, your pH is lime green, which means it's 6.5, but it's not going to tell you how to make that lime green soil into the 7 pH that you need it to be. So some good general tips for fertilizing is always read the label and the directions on the bag. If it's too small for you to read, go ahead and look it up online. And I guarantee you the company will have those labels online. And if not, call and ask them to send you a PDF of them because this is gonna help you figure out how to use this fertilizer ideally because you paid good money for it and you don't wanna waste it and overuse it in part because that can hurt your plants and the environment, but also because you paid for it. Um, most of the times when we're applying fertilizer, you want to focus on nitrogen. Nitrogen is one of the few things that your soil test is not going to tell you because it moves so rapidly through the environment. And as soon as it's in the soil, it will start evaporating into the air and other stuff. So it's very finicky in that way. So ideally you want to put on as much nitrogen as your plants need and no more, no less. Um, how much that need they're going to need is going to vary a lot based off of the type of plants you're growing. So tomatoes are going to need more than say like cabbage will need or versus peppers or corn. So this is one of those things where we recommend looking up the actual recommendations, particularly if you're doing a large garden. If you're just doing kind of a smaller thing and you're not looking to get the most pristine yield, but you're just feeding maybe you and your family, you can use the basic standards. Um, but if you do need um, you can get a little bit more picky about it if you are making larger gardens and you can block off certain things. We do recommend that when it comes to putting down fertilizer that you put about half of your recommended amount at or before planting and then another half when the plants start flowering. Um, ideally, if you put it all down, um, a lot of it can get absorbed or taken or get moved so it won't be there when they need them for flowering and fruiting. So you do want to be careful about over fertilizing because um, if you over fertilize with too much nitrogen or N, this can lead to very lush green plants, but not a lot of fruit. Basically what happens is plants tend to flower and fruit when they start to get a little stressed. If not, then they just think, oh, I've got plenty of food here. It's nice and sunny. I'll just keep growing and living on my own life and I don't need to reproduce and have kids yet. So when you stress them out a little bit, that's when it sort of triggers them. Oh, it's time for me to make flowers and, you know, offspring, which is basically what the point of the fruit or the vegetable would be. Um, over applying fertilizer can also encourage insect pests and diseases. It can contribute to water pollution, specifically for those of us in Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay. And it can also cause plant burn, which is what you're seeing on these green beans right here. So all of this dark shady tan color is actually where too much nitrogen was put on top of the plant and it caused a burning effect. So your general nitrogen recommendation is gonna be about two pounds per thousand square foot um, or about a fourth of a pound per hundred square foot. And you can measure that out. It's roughly about 3.2 ounces. But again, if you look at the actual fertilizer that you're using, there should be a recommendation and some conversions on the bag, or you can check the Home and Garden Information Center. We also have um, some handouts that'll talk about how to convert to make sure that you're fertilizing exactly how much you should be doing. Um, as far as the different types of fertilizer, um, I'm just generally going to explain um, some of the ones you'll see if you were to go to um, like a garden store like Home Depot or something. Um, so inorganic or synthetic fertilizers, um, these are fairly common and um, they are the most, I think, economical form of fertilizer that you can buy. Um, I like to gravitate towards um, the soluble form. So this um, right up here, like this powder one here, you would mix with water before adding to plants. 
or um, this here is an example of um, a slow release fertilizer. And so usually those will be in like pearl kind of pellets. Um, there's also um, uh, other mixes that are like granular fertilizer that you apply directly to the soil above um, the plants. I kind of stay away from those um, because it, uh, I've found that it's easier to burn your plants with those, at least in my experience. So um, I don't mind using the synthetic fertilizers. They are um, kind of a cheap form. And what I like is that they tell you exactly how much nitrogen, potassium, um, or sorry, uh, phosphorus and potassium you're adding. So, um, you know, they say this right on here. Um, uh, these, these nutrients, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus are the most important um, macronutrients for plants, um, specifically nitrogen, but also um, potassium and, and phosphorus, they matter too. So uh, for home gardeners, this can be a really economical choice. You can also, um, if you are interested in gardening organically, there are a lot of different kinds of um, organic fertilizer to choose from. Typically, uh, these are going to release nutrients more slowly um, because they are sort of more tightly bound in the fertilizer mixture because um, a lot of these fertilizers are derived from uh, like this one here, I think, what is this? There's blood meal, bone meal, uh, fish meal, um, kelp meal. These are all basically derived from um, an organic source um, and, you know, uh, have the nutrient values that you want to add into your garden, but um, they're a little bit more tied up than those synthetic forms. So um, these can be good for long-term soil health and um, they're just gonna be a little bit more expensive. The other thing I wanna mention is that uh, compost, while technically it's not a fertilizer, it can add a little bit of nutrient um, when you use it as a soil amendment. So um, it's always a good idea to be adding compost to your soil, um, especially if your, your um, soil test comes back and you have low organic matter. Compost is one of the ways that you can add organic matter back to soil. Um, as far as irrigating your plants, here in Maryland and anywhere south, you're definitely going to need um, some kind of irrigation. And we really recommend using something like a drip or soaker hose irrigation system. You do not need to have something as fancy as this timer set up here, although that kind of allows you to go on vacation and not worry so much about um, keeping up your garden. Uh, as long as you have a soaker hose that is um, directly in contact with the soil above your plants, um, you're being a lot more efficient than overhead um, irrigation because that water is um, directly uh, dripping down into the soil. Um, it also cuts down on some of the, the foliar um, or leaf diseases that you can be spreading watering on the surface. Um, so, uh, we, we highly encourage that you just go out and buy a soaker hose. These you can leave on for, um, you know, a couple of hours until the soil feels moist. And that's really going to be the best irrigation system for a garden. We are. Okay. So now that you've gotten a lot of the basics kind of taken care of about your soil and your water, now comes the fun part, which is actually getting plants in the ground. So one of the important things that people need to think about is are you going to direct seed them? Meaning, are you going to put seeds directly into your outdoor soil and let them grow? Or are you going to get transplants, which would be seedlings that are a few inches tall that either you yourself grew or you bought at say like a nursery or a big box store and then transplanted them in. So certain crops actually do better when they are direct seeded. And these tend to be ones that have really fragile root systems. So this would be things like a lot of your ground root crops. So things like beets and turnips and carrots. Other ones um, such as like beans and spinach and sweet corn have very delicate fragile roots and they just don't like being transplanted very well. The perk of doing 
some of your larger summer vegetables as transplants is that it does allow you to get kind of an earlier jump on the season. You normally wouldn't be able to put these out until mid-May. So by putting them out as transplants, you're saving yourself a few weeks there where it would take for those seeds to germinate. You definitely could start out any of them as direct seeds, but it does take them a little bit more time to establish outside versus inside. And because they're outside and exposed to the elements, it does have a little bit more of a risk attached to it. Okay. So when it comes to direct seeding, again, there are certain crops that this is kind of more ideal for. Um, a good rule of thumb is that you want to sow the seeds about two to three times the depth as they are wide. And you can see from the picture here that seeds come in a wide variety of shapes, sizes, um, so you do want to take into consideration really reading that seed packet and seeing how they say to go ahead about sowing them, how deep it should go. Most people tend to like to dig a little furrow and put them in there. You can also, some crops are going to want mounds instead, so you can build those up and then go through and direct seed. It's important to make sure that your soil is moist when you plant them, but not sopping wet. So you definitely don't want it spongy. You don't want it to be able to wring out water. I tend to tell people you wanna be able to run your fingers through the soil and not have it be clumpy in your hand. Um, so you could have a dusting of it on there, but if it's like wet and stuck to your hand, it's probably too wet because if you plant in that, your seeds will likely rot. Uh, we recommend going ahead and watering the soil beforehand if need be, and then letting it sit for a few hours to dry out and then putting in your seeds. After you've applied the seeds in, you do want to make sure that you firmly pat down soil or compost on top of them. A lot of people get really worried that the seeds won't be able to get through, but if you don't pat them down and the soil on top erodes off of them, then the seed will likely dry out and won't germinate either. One way you can get around this is to use either boards, newspaper, or floating row covers to cover them up. And this will do two things. It helps to hold, in, hold moisture, but it also sometimes helps to hold heat. Particularly in the springtime, this can be really beneficial to help with germination. You do wanna check daily though, because once the seeds have germinated, you don't wanna continue covering them with either cardboard or newspaper. You can keep the floating row cover on because light can penetrate that but um, even then you kind of want to check. And any weeds that come up because you disturb the soil, you're going to want to go ahead and pull so that they're not competing with your little tiny baby plants. When it comes to using transplants, people always kind of go back and forth about whether or not they should start their own or if they should buy them. And there's sort of perks to both. Um, starting your own allows you to have a really wide variety of seeds to pick from because you can basically any seed catalog that you can find that you can afford and order from, you can make those plants. You can start those plants and you can have them for your garden versus if you're buying transplants, you're sort of limited to what you can find locally in your stores or at your farmer's market. Um, a lot of times seeds tend to cost less than transplants are, but starting your seeds comes with some additional upstart costs. In particular, you're gonna need something to start those seeds in container wise, and then you're gonna need seed starting medium. You can't just start seeds inside in your normal outdoor soil. Um, it seems kind of weird because we just talked about how you can direct seed outside, but your soil outside has a lot of bacteria and fungal and really beneficial things in it that we like, but that can really hinder seeds when they're inside in a warmer environment and haven't had a chance to establish. So, you do need some extra equipment, which kind of raises the cost a little bit of starting your own, but actually it'll end up narrowing out if you're planting a whole bunch of one particular type. Um, the other thing you need to take into consideration is that you do need to spend time starting your own transplants and then providing them a space inside where they will be safe. And, you know, if you're someone who has kids and pets and stuff, that might be a little bit trickier. And in fact, if you wanted something like eggplants and peppers and tomatoes, you would actually be starting those transplants in the next week or so. Um, you'd be starting them in about the first half of March. And if you want to know more specifically about starting seeds, um, the flyer that's here is for the Cabin Fever Spring webinars. This is being held by some of our coworkers. And on March 12th, they're actually giving 
a two hour talk with a demonstration about how to start your own seeds. And they'll talk about vegetable seeds, flower seeds, and native plant seeds. So if you're interested in that, you can go to the URL that is at the bottom and sign up for it. It is free as well. So once you've gotten your seeds in the plants in the ground, um, you need to be prepared that some stuff is going to go wrong. Um, we live in a, in a world and it's outside and you're going to have some rabbits that hop through and munch on some things. You're gonna have some bugs out in your garden. There's gonna be some stormy weather. You're not gonna get crystal pristine vegetables every single time like you see in the store. What you see in the store is normally the best of the best that farmers can grow. And their ugly stuff normally goes to canning companies or gets processed in some way. Or in the case of something like these tomatoes that are cracked, those are considered unedible. So they'd end up in a compost bin. So be prepared to get a mixture of sizes and shapes and colors from your produce, which can be kind of fun to see and experiment and see what you get. But you're also going to have things like cracking, discoloration, deformity, and feeding damage. Um, we are giving a talk on IPM in part of this program on April 6th. So we'll talk a little bit more about this kind of stuff in detail, but I'm going to hit on some basic common stuff that you'll see right now. So awesome. So for our solanaceous crops, these would be things like tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. Some common diseases you're likely going to encounter will be things like bacteria, leaf spot, and then they do have a wide variety of viruses that will interfere with them. Um, the leaf spots are Sounds exactly what it is. They're just going to be little tiny spots all over the leaves. And the viruses will normally cause some leaf deformities and some banding patterns. When it comes to insects, hornworms, like the one you're seeing here, is probably the most likely thing you're going to get on tomato plants. A handful of them on your plants, likely you'll be okay. If you get a lot of them, they can defoliate a plant, though. You may also get things like spider mates. Um, eggplants are notorious for getting flea beetles and Colorado potato beetles. You'll oftentimes probably find stink bugs on these. And then fruit borers is another one that potentially could make your fruit inedible because once you have a caterpillar living inside of it, you don't normally want to eat it. Some common um, environmental ones that you may come across would be things like blossom end rot, sun scold, cat facing, poor fruit set, and fruit weight. So cucurbits are going to be things like cucumber, squash, pumpkin, zucchinis, and melons. Um, bacteria wilt and downy and powdery mildew are probably the most common ones that you're going to encounter. Um, for insect pressure, you'd probably come across these two top insects here, which is the striped and spotted cucumber beetles. You may also get things like the squash vine borer or squash bugs. And then these guys also can get affected by blossom end rot, poor pollination, and then the melons in particular may have what we call hollow heart syndrome. Finally, the brassicas. So these would be those spring and fall kind of vegetable crops that you would be growing. So broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, all of those. Downy mildew is probably the most common one disease-wise you're going to come across, but there are a few other rots, particularly if you get a really wet spring or fall that may be an issue for you. Insect-wise, flea beetles, harlequin bugs, and then there are a wide variety of caterpillars um, that you can find on these guys. And the biggest concern you're going to have with these is what we call bolting. Because they like it cold, if you do get a few warm days, that kind of triggers the plant to start flowering. And as soon as it flowers, it, the vegetable part that you'd eat becomes really bitter. Okay, so um, weeding. Not everybody's favorite um, thing about gardening, but it's really um, super important and it's, it's going to help your plants um, get established. Um, if you allow weeds to persist in your garden, they're going to compete with your plants for um, both the nutrients, um, but also for light. So it's, it's a good thing to get on top of your weeding early on in the season. So um, one way to sort of lessen your workload um, is to do mulching. So like in the bottom right picture we have here, um, with this uh, straw that's been added to the, um, this tomato bed, um, they're really keeping the weed pressure down. So by mulching, um, you're, you're preventing the weeds um, from, from kind of emerging and getting enough light to, to come through. Uh, you can also hand pull weeds, especially if you just have a small garden, like a container garden or um, a couple of raised beds. 
This is pretty easy to do. Do it when the weeds are small. Um, if you have a lot more space that you're gardening, use a sharp hoe um, like this person. And then um, herbicides, I'm gonna say, we really don't recommend that um, home gardeners, you know, go out and buy Roundup because um, A, it's really easy to accidentally, um, you know, off target, hit your plants um, and burn them with a herbicide. But uh, also, you know, um, it's fairly easy in most gardens for you to do your own weeding. weeding. Now you can use some types of organic herbicides, or there are a lot of garden blogs where they say, okay, you can pour vinegar on weeds. Um, really, uh, I still don't recommend that because um, a lot of the sort of home remedies other than things like neem oil, um, which will keep pesticide or which will keep pests off of your plants. These uh, like homemade herbicides um, could be affecting your soil health long-term. So I would try to stay away from them. The only product that I've used that I kind of like is Preen, um, which is good. I would use it more in flower beds in places where you're only putting in transplants and you're never going to be germinating seeds um, because it prevents uh, seed germination. So that's really the only one that I like personally. Um, now, as far as actually identifying what is a weed and what is a garden plant? This can be really tricky. Um, if you are not growing in a raised bed, um, if you just you know, cultivated the space in your backyard, you may start to see a lot of plants emerging. Uh, and so this is where having really neat rows um, and really uniformly spacing your plants can help you um, because anything in between rows, you know, is going to be a weed. Um, and then, you know, at, if you can't tell if something is a weed or not, let it get a little bit bigger. Um, and then you can use things like um, common weed guides. So we have one up here from Maryland, um, which just has photos of all the different weeds that are common in gardens. Um, and they're just, there's so many that um, it really helps to have like a printed out version of one of these guides. Okay, so um, as far as season extension, um, here in Maryland, uh, you can basically uh, extend your fall season um, and keep some of these cold weather vegetables um, alive with a couple of different techniques. So um, anything that's like a leafy green like spinach, um, but also like carrots and um, chard, leeks, um, broccoli. So these are all things that you can um, help uh, give them a fall season with some of the things we'll talk about here. So um, mulching, this will actually um, provide another layer of insulation to the soil. So um, if you mulch your plants early, so before, um, before the frost starts, um, this is a pretty cheap thing to do. Um, and uh, yeah, you basically, you wanna start um, mulching, maybe around the first frost, um, but before the ground freezes. And then um, floating row covers. I know Emily had mentioned this before, but um, there are a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, if you have something that's low to the ground, you can just cover, cover them with a tarp. It helps if this floating row cover um, lets through light. So something like a clear plastic shower curtain is a good choice. Um, and then you can just get these like PVC um, half, half circle loops. Um, and you can very cheaply build your own low tunnel um, through something like kale. Um, and what these are basically doing is creating a greenhouse effect um, and keeping the plants a little bit warmer than they would be um, in the open air. And that's going to allow them to grow, like continue growing, um, even when it's cold. Because basically, plants are shutting down when it's cold. Um, the enzymes and processes that are happening, they, they're not like us. We keep ourselves at a constant temperature so that we can basically um, keep going no matter how warm or cold it is outside. Plants really need those heat units um, to keep growing. 
And then kind of the most intense way to extend your season is by building a cold frame. Um, this is probably gonna cost the most, but there are a lot of really cool different DIY ways to um, build them. Um, all you have to do is type in cold frame DIY on Google. You will get so many results. You can use either glass um, or plastic, clear plastic. And this works really well if you have um, a crop that's not that tall. Uh, you can build one of these. It helps if you have like a hinge here so that you can open it to harvest. Um, this picture right here is carrots and um, lettuce is another good one for um, cold season. Um, cold frames. And one thing I like about this, if you're planting a fall garden, a lot of times you don't have enough heat units to get a harvest. Um, but if you build, uh, if you build one of these cold frames, you will get a good harvest and you're not at risk of like um, your lettuce bolting because it's not going to get warm later in the season. Whereas if you plant lettuce in the spring um, and you're just hoping it won't get warm, uh, you can get lucky, but sometimes, sometimes, you know, you run into these issues where, where they bolt. So this is a really good option if you really want to have fall cool crops. Okay. I don't think we have time to do these fun things to try, but if you want our slides, I think Emily's going to add them to the chat. We have a PDF, um, so you can get all of these slides. And, um, again, we are, Haley and Emily, um, our email addresses are on the screen and we will now, um, I think Emily's gonna come off mute and we're gonna answer some of the questions we have in the chat. Yeah, can we, okay. So, um, so one of the first questions that we had was, um, is Mother's Day a good measure for when to plant in Maryland? And I would say for the most part, yes, Mother's Day tends to be a good one for central Maryland. If you live on the Eastern shore, you can normally do it a little bit before Mother's Day. If you live in the Western Maryland, you can normally do it around Mother's Day and maybe just have like row covers or a tarp to go over that. Um, it sort of varies a little bit. Mother's Day tends to be sort of like the the guaranteed date after you can do it a little bit before, but you do have a slight risk there that you may still get some frost damage. Um, so again, if you have like a tarp or some floating row covers to cover it in case we get those frantic frost dates, you should be good then. Yeah, the floating row covers should help a lot. I know last year here on the Eastern shore, um, there was a freak freeze that was later than the historic last frost date. And that can happen. So if you do have something to cover your plants, that can save your little seedlings because they are really vulnerable when they're small. Um, uh, using compost uh, versus manure versus using fertilizer. Oof. Do you want me to take that? Yep, I'll let you take that while I get the PDF up. Okay, so... Um, we are going to strongly recommend that you don't apply any fresh manure um, that hasn't been composted to your garden. Um, if only uh, because there are, there are pathogens in most animal manure that can infect humans. So um, we will talk two weeks ago um, about different kinds of compost and we touched on animal manure there, but basically um, if you have animals, like say you have your own chickens or you have horses or something, you definitely want to pile up all of that manure, um, let it heat up and basically neutralize any potential pathogens that are in there for a couple of months. And they're actually like specific recommendations you're supposed to follow, um, basically to prevent you from um, getting some of these um, food poisoning outbreaks that we have um, things that uh, really cause a lot of damage, not just to coli, but there are some actually um, really bad ones. So uh, if you have manure, compost it. Um, compost, if it's from a, like there are a lot of different kinds of compost there. There's compost from just plant products, but then there are a lot of manure compost. Those, the manure compost tend to be um, high in specific uh, nutrients. And so you do wanna be careful to make sure you look at the label and see what types of nutrients you have in there because 
Actually, if you apply too much manure compost, you can start to have problems with salt because a lot of those um, nutrients, they're, they're nutrients, but if you have too much of a good thing, that can also end up being a poison. So um, anything else to add, Emily? Nope, I think you got it. Do you wanna go ahead and run the poll while we answer these questions I just realized? Oh, yeah. 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 So one of the next questions we got was what about, uh, what are our thoughts on tillage in the home garden? Um, and tillage can be a really effective way to help with weed control, but you can also cause more damage with it because you are bringing weed seeds up to the top. So you can definitely try doing no tillage gardening if you'd like. Um, there's a whole bunch of new information coming out about it. I know our coordinator for the Home and Garden Information Center is a Abbott fan about using no-till in the backyard garden. So there's a whole bunch of resources there. But if you also feel the need to till, it's not the end of the world either. Um, if you have, in this case, they said they have heavy clay and it's hard to grow in, I might recommend in that case, um, you might try doing container gardening or putting in a raised bed instead, because you, along with your heavy clay, that's gonna hold a lot of water. So your drainage issues are probably gonna be a big issue there. So I might invest in a raised bed or some containers rather than trying to do in ground. So um, another question we got, which I'll let you take Haley is, can heirloom varieties and hybrids cross pollinate? Yeah, so um, if you have heirlooms and hybrids in your garden, sure, they can cross pollinate um, like tomatoes. Um, you're basically what's going to happen is your seed, the seed of the next generation is going to be more like it's, it's going to be segregating. It's not going to be the same as either parent, um, much like human children aren't the same as either parent. Um, so really only if you have an inbred where it isn't cross pollinated, will it have the same seed? So if you have um, a bunch of different tomato varieties, even if they're all inbred, if you have a lot of bee activity and there is cross-pollination, your seeds may not be true to type. And I didn't cover that, so I should mention. Um, that's fine though, because that's just one of those things where you get to have a fun experiment next year and figure out what you get. So um, someone asked about sending in more than one soil sample for different parts of their yard. So if you have a section of your yard that has been turf grass for years and you're going to convert it all to a garden, you probably only need one soil sample for it. Even if you're going to say like, you know, this square foot's tomatoes and this is corn, it's, it's all going to kind of be the same. But if you're converting parts of your yard that had different plants on them or were different purposes, then yeah, you may want to go ahead and take different soil samples and send them away. And then once you've mitigated it for a few years and it's more neutral and the same, then you could just take one big soil sample for the whole thing in following years. Do you have any other thoughts on that, Haley? No, I think that's good. I mean, only two really different sections of your yard. Yeah. Um, so someone had a question about the 17 year cicadas, which we are supposed to get. Um, so the good news is that the 17 year cicadas, while we are going to get them this year, depending on where you are, they may or may not be as heavy. And in all reality, they shouldn't be that big of a concern for vegetable gardens. Most of the cicadas are going to want woody plants instead. So if you have something like a trellis up for cucumbers or tomatoes or something, they may climb up on that to pupate. You might find them sitting and chirping on there, but they really want to feed on woody tissue. So you're more likely going to find them on trees, then you're going to find them on tomato plants or squash or something like that. If they are, they fell in there by accident. They're not feeding on them. Um, so I wouldn't be too concerned about them at all. You're likely also like, because they live underground, but they're feeding on tree roots, unless you put your vegetable garden right under a tree, which we wouldn't recommend doing because it would shade your garden too much. You're not likely even going to have much issue with them coming out of the ground in your vegetable garden. Um, so in general, what are some preventative ideas for garden pests, such as spider mites, aphids, and caterpillars? So I would say tune in on April 6th. We'll go a little bit more in depth in this for things like spider mites and aphids. I would encourage kind of proper pruning and opening up airways. They really kind of like 
humid environments. So if you do take some time to prune back your plants, you'll definitely add more air circulation in there. Um, if you also do community planting, so plant some flowers in with your vegetables, that's gonna bring in a lot of your natural enemies. So your ladybird beetles and your lace wings and your parasitic wasps that are gonna really help control those populations. Same thing with caterpillars. Um, the floating row covers early on can really help with the caterpillars because if the butterflies can't get to your produce, they can't lay eggs on there. But again, come like mid season when you have those vegetable crops that need to be pollinated to bear you fruit, you can't have floating row covers on them all the time. Um, some of those things you can also, like caterpillars, you can hand pick off. Send, send your kid or a neighborhood kid out there and give them a nickel every caterpillar they pick off. Um, hornworms glow in the dark. Go out there with a black light, you could find those things in the nighttime really easily. It's really fun. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be too worried about that. Normally, they're not actually major enough pests that I, any sort of chemical control needs to get done in home gardens. Um, so we did have some people ask about getting access to the PowerPoint in the video and I shared the link in the chat and then you guys should get an email with a recording of this video um, sometime in the next few days once we have it up. Um, so here's a question I'll let you take Haley. What time of year should I test my soil? So great question. Um, you can do this as early as the fall before um, like a spring planting. And if you are going to plant like the cool weather spring crops, I would say do it the fall before. Um, reason being is that um, if, you know, uh, your soil test comes back and they tell you they want you to like it, it's a good idea to add, say, boron and maybe some uh, potassium. The uh, most of these elements are going to take a while um, to get into your soil and become available to plants. There are a lot of there's a whole dynamic of soil chemistry happening below the surface, and most of those um, compounds that are being tested for in the soil sample aren't going to be available within the first month of you applying them. So do it early. Um, the only nutrient that I can think of that really um, like gets into soil and then leaves soil quickly uh, it is nitrogen. And most soil tests aren't gonna test for that. And you just know every year that you're gonna have to add nitrogen almost no matter what, unless you're doing some really serious cover cropping where you're adding a lot of nitrogen back. Any thoughts, Emily? Nope, I think you did that one well. Um... So the next one we had is for crops such as broccoli, can they be started before May? And yes, the answer would be oh. all of those like uh, brassica crops. So all those cold season ones, you would want those in the ground before May because they'd be coming out around May when you'd be putting in your warm season ones like tomatoes and peppers. So I should have clarified that a little bit better. No, those ones you would want to go ahead and check um, the packet for germination rates, but you would want them to be done germinating around Mother's Day so that you could pull them out to put the other ones in. If you check the Home and Garden Information Center calendar, it'll give you again those approximate like when to start transplants, when to put them outside, when to direct to seed. I just can't recall them off the top of my head. So um, how far into winter will crops typically survive in a cold frame? How long does extending the growing season um, last? So this is going to depend on where you are in Maryland and how severe your winter is. Um, and then also the crop type. So I think like something like spinach can survive down to like, I don't know, like five or 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And that cold frame just kind of, if you've got full sun during the day, um, that can really heat it up, you know, quite a few degrees. So a lot of your leafy greens, especially the ones that you harvest and they keep coming back like spinach, you can have them the whole season, like into the spring. Um, do, you, do you have cold frames, Emily? Do you have any experience with that? I, I've done a little bit with cold frames. So your leafy greens, you can get going. The one thing that sometimes is a bigger issue than temperature is sunlight. So like your brassicas, I've managed to grow things like 
broccoli and Brussels sprouts and harvest them up through Christmas and New Year's and years when we've had mild winters. It's just an issue if they start to peter off because of sunlight, if you have too mild of a winter. But the leafy greens, you can normally get at least through mid-January. Um, they tend to not do great in that like end of January through February. Like now's the time where they're sort of looking a little drabby, but they'll normally pick back up once the day length starts to pick up and it starts to get a little bit warmer. But again, those are all ones that you would direct to seed. And I've seen people literally take a, a bag of compost or soil and flip it over with one of those plastic bins on the top as a makeshift um, like greenhouse and they've grown leafy greens. So if you've got 20 extra bucks and you're a little bored, it, it's a great science fair project if nothing else, right? Okay. Um, so I keep seeing well composted manure. How do you know store-bought compost is well composted? Um, if it's no longer smells, um, is there a good indicator? So anything that you're buying at like Lowe's and Home Depot, there that's that's gonna be like inert compost. Um, they're coming from reputable companies that are going to have like standards for their compost. They're gonna have to, you know, test it to make sure it gets up to a certain um, temperature, I think it's like 150 40. or 30, yeah, 130 I can't remember. to 140, I believe. Yeah. And so, um, they're going to have to like follow specific practices. If you buy it from a store, if you are kind of a larger gardener and you buy it from, you know, some guy that makes compost because he's a chicken farmer, then you might want to be a little bit more careful. But anything you get at Home Depot um, or Lowe's or Walmart, that, that should be fine. Yeah. I'd also say to add to that, if you want to be on the safe side, um, you can also look for compost that doesn't have any animal products in it. So you can look for compost like leaf grow or vegetable stuff. Um, some counties actually have their own composting facilities and then give that away for free. It would be like all the leaves in the fall and stuff like that but you're sort of getting a mixed bag when it comes to that. So that's a little bit of a hit and miss. Um, I would use that more as a soil amendment than as a fertilizer. So you can definitely put that in your soil to think, cool, I'm gonna add some organic matter, but don't bank on it being your fertilizer for the year. So I will note um, to, um, I know our other, um, we have another ag extension agent, Jenny Rosencrantz in my county, and she personally doesn't like to use um, the free county um, compost mulch um, because she said she's used it before and it brought weed seeds into her garden. So remember anything that you're getting from free from the county or the city is not going to be um, screened the same way that a mulch or a fertilizer that's being sold to you from Home Depot or Walmart is. You know That could have whoever's weeds, um, you know, all mixed in together. They're not checking to make sure that it got up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So just, yeah, take it with a grain of sand. It's free, but may not be the highest quality. Um, you can also always start your own compost bin. And if you are gardening a lot, that's a great activity to do. We had a talk about it two weeks ago. So if you were not able to join us for that and you're interested in it, you can shoot either one of us an email and we can get you the video recording from that. You can also check on the UME website underneath our event page because we have other garden talks coming up and there are definitely some other agents that will be talking about composting. So I see one last question here. So if you guys have any other questions, put them in the chat now, which was how do you protect ornamental trees from cicadas? And the best thing that you can do for your ornamental trees, or if you have fruit trees, is to put netting over them. If your tree is over five years old, though, and is well established, don't worry about the cicadas. I promise. That tree can be covered in cicadas, and it's going to be just fine. It's only the newly planted and younger ones that you really need to worry about. And those would be small enough that you could get about a one centimeter to half an inch netting and put it over it, bundle it up around the base, tie it around, the cicadas will hang on that netting, the tree will be fine, you can take it off um, around the end of July when all the cicadas are gone and the tree will be perfectly fine then. Um, you do not wanna bother play, applying any chemicals, chemicals are not gonna work on these cicadas. You're just gonna be wasting your money. So better to invest in netting than chemicals. So 
with that, um, I don't see any other questions. So thank you guys again so much. Um, oh, let's see. When to test my soil? You can test your soil at any time. I would recommend if you haven't done it yet and you're planning to garden this year, go ahead and do it now. Yep. As long as your ground isn't frozen, you can test your soil. And if you need help or you want any information about it, contact your local county extension agent. They are usually happy to give you directions, instructions, maybe even lend you a soil probe. So, yeah. Okay. Well, so, yeah. Thanks um, again. Everybody so have a good night. Everyone. Take care. And we're going to go ahead. Um, thanks for coming. I'm going to stop the recording.